The best first woodwick. The best first woodwork. Woodwork. I, man, that's tough. The best first woodworking project you can build should be something you want to have that you want to build that you have the tools and equipment for. I guess you're here because you can't check those boxes, or you just you just don't know. You just want to build something. That's cool. I have a recommendation for uh, the second best, then, which I guess would actually be your best, so it's still the best. Whatever. A table. I think it checks all the boxes for a great beginner or even first project. I think a great beginner project should be something that's very approachable, something that's going to be useful for most people who can't use a table that scales. The principles we're going to use and how we build this, you can use to build a side table like we're going to do, or a sofa table, a dining table. Principles all apply and uh, get to exercise a lot of the fundamentals. It should also be something you can build with a very basic tool set. I've always sworn I'm never going to do this, but leaving all my machines alone, and I'm only going to build this with uh, some really, really common tools that you probably have, can get very affordably, or a very good chance you can borrow from a friend because they're common. First thing we're going to do, I'm just using some scrap here, is mm -hmm. I need to do a glue up to make my top, which is a panel glue up, very common in woodworking. If for any reason you're not set up, the nice thing is you can either buy a board wide enough or uh, Home Depot oven lows in the millwork section, normally down low on the shelves. Both of them actually have pre-glued up panels of various sizes. So get the size that fits for you or is it a little bit larger and then cut it down to the size you need if you're not set up to do a panel. The table I need in my house is a little triangular table to go in the corner by my back door because we've got dog collars and stuff and there's no good place for them. This top is gonna have them to be white oak and then the legs are maple. This could all be pine, poplar, cedar, whatever you have, whatever you can get. I do recommend, you probably don't have milling machines to work with rough material, this is already surfaced on two sides. I've already machined it at some point for a project, so it's smooth on both sides. Go buy wood that's already smooth on two sides, because otherwise you gotta go through the whole milling process. First thing I'm gonna do is just cut this down closer to the sizes I need. If I had a little contractor tabletop table saw, I would use that. I don't, all I have is this table saw, but especially since we're doing a fairly small boards, small table saw would be just fine, even big boards. No big deal, just be careful. Man, I just realized I did this probably the most inefficient way possible. Oh well, it's gonna be fine. Now if the material you can source has perfectly straight edges and they're really nice and square to the face, so this is the face, this is the edge, you can skip this also, especially if they're straight. Mine's not, so if it's not, a hand plane would be another option, but you need to straighten them up and that's what we're gonna do here at the table saw. There is a little bit of a trick to jointing at the table saw when we're gonna do a glue up. My blade is very, very close to 90, but not exactly. The more off, the more obvious it is. So what I'm gonna do is mark on the end of my board which side is going against the table and against the blade. So I'm gonna make a little notchy do. So I've got a little indicator. After I do all my cuts, I'll show you how I line these up after. And when you're using machines and power tools, remember your PPE, eyes and ears. Now this board happened to get cut on the outside edge. This one didn't, doesn't matter at this point because the inside is where we're gluing, not the outsides. We have nice, clean wood on the inside and out. Now, as far as the orientation, you'll see that they alternate. This cancels out any error in the blade deviating from 90. I can show you. Cause you kind of have three options here. Either your blade is somehow perfectly set up, which it's probably never gonna be, or you cancel out your error by aligning things correctly, or you double your error, making it worse. So you either, it's perfect or worse. You'll notice here, if I line them up the same instead of alternating, and what I did is I just cut these at a more severe angle so it show up. See how instead of flat, it's like, whoa, that's not cool at all. But if I come over here and do the alternate, see there, I forget my geometry, complementary. I think that's called complementary angles. And now it's flat on top. So it canceled out. Now, obviously you don't want to do this willy nilly and not care what your blade angle is because if I try to glue this and it's too severe, the clamps are actually going to make them want to, you know, slide apart. So you do want to be close to 90, especially if you're beginning, you probably never want to glue up more than one edge at a time. The amount of error you see there 
might not even be noticeable, but if you're doing a larger panel where you have four, five, six, seven, eight glue lines and you're kind of willy nilly, each time, you know, that error magnifies and magnifies and becomes more visible. Now I'm using a combination blade in my table saw, which, and it's a little old, so it doesn't give me the absolute best edge. There's some tooth marks and what will help minimize that is cutting really slow. I, I was cutting a little fast and so I have all these ridges, which come up with a fine glue joint. This would still come together fine as is, but I want it to be a little bit better. And I do have hand planes and I feel like hand planes are pretty common. So I'm just gonna do a few swipes just to smooth this out some. I have a video out about these specific planes. These are great for beginners because everything that intimidates you about normal traditional hand planes like I have over here, you know, having to have a sharpening setup, learning how to sharpen, how to set up the plane, dial it in, and then use it, that all goes away. It's literally one little lever and the blade self-registers and they're very affordable, so. This hurts my heart, but in fairness to you, my beautiful parallel bar clamps are gonna stay right here and I'm not gonna use them. Glue, uh, any PVA glue is fine for wood. This is Type Bond 2, and I just like these little upside down condiment squeezers for the same reason they're awesome when they finally started putting ketchup in upside down bottles. It's just there. That was honestly way more glue than I needed. And here's something I used to wonder. Can you glue just one, put glue on just one side or do you need to put glue on both sides? Well, I've only put glue on one side for a long time and I've never had a glue joint fail. And the reason, besides my experience, that I felt fine with that is I was listening to a podcast with the CEO or president of, I wanna say, Gorilla Glue, and he was asked that question. Hey, you're a glue expert, you make glue. What do I, I need to do? Do I need to do both sides or one side? And he said, you only have to do one side, that's fine, but they do like people who do both sides more because they use more glue. So you sell more glue if people use more glue. So do with that what you will. So I'm just gonna use these F clamps because I don't have bar clamps anymore. Sold those a while ago when I built out my parallel clamp collection. And this is not at all what these clamps are for, but it's gonna work. That's the point, use what you got. All right, once I got these together, I'm just gonna give them a little shimmy to really help work that glue in. You might be thinking, oh, but you know, I've been reading and I know those are expensive, but one of the things that makes parallel bar clamps so awesome and why they're expensive is how much clamping force you can get, you can really get a whole lot of force on there and doesn't glue need just an absolute ton of force. No, it really doesn't. Um, you only need a ton of force on your glue ups if your boards are milled improperly. If these aren't nice and straight and you're trying to force the boards together because they're not straight, that's when you need tons of clamping force and that makes a much weaker glue up. Um, just a little pass hand tight is all glue needs to set up well and give you a good glue bond. What these F clamps are good for is to help with alignment. Fortunately, everything's pretty flat and everything's staying together. I don't have any big lips, but on the corners, I am a little off. So I'm gonna use these just to help bring these joints flush. And since my boards are flat, just doing the edges here will be all these need to stay flat just about the whole way across and whatever isn't can be dealt with with the sander. Something you'll hear and see talked about a lot with glue ups is your squeeze out. Honestly, this much squeeze out just means I used more glue than I needed to. But the other thing it does tell us is this is nice and flat. If we have even squeeze out, that means we have equal pressure across the, across the whole joint. But you really definitely don't wanna see is like a lot of squeeze out in some areas and then no squeeze out or even gaps between them. That means your boards aren't touching and PVA glue, most wood glues really, especially PVA, polyvinyl acetate, is not a gap filling glue. What it does is help bond surfaces together. So as long as they're physically in contact with only a little bit of glue kind of being the medium, it's gonna have a fantastic bond. But if there's a gap and it's trying to span that gap, PVA does not do that. It's not gonna be strong. But so long as they're touching, you don't need anything else on a long grain edge to edge glue up like this. Wood glue is plenty strong for any purpose. I actually clamped this up at the end of the day, the yesterday, so it's had overnight to sit, which I try to do with, with my glue ups. And if you don't have a lot of room in your shop, that's always a good tip.
because then you don't have to worry about trying to, you know, your glue up being in the way, especially if you do it on your work surface or something. If that doesn't work for you though, then realize most PVAs only require about two hours of clamp time and then you can unclamp it. And especially on three quarter inch material, like, like this, I have definitely many times when I've been in a hurry, only done the two hours, pulled it out of clamps. Glue does take upwards of 24 hours to fully set for regular working. Two hours is fine and I've been able to run it through my planer, through my sander, start cutting it down and reshaping or whatever. What you don't want to do is after two hours, take it off and then start like beating it against stuff. We've got a panel now. Let's do some scrapage and then get some initial sanding done on this. This is pretty rough, so I'm gonna start with 80 grit paper on my sander that's pretty aggressive and will help smooth things out pretty quick. Now, if your glue up isn't perfect, got any issues, and this will fit through your planer and you have a planer, you can by all means do that to smooth things out, but you can also do it all with a sander. Obviously, I'm blessed to have a really nice sander from Surf Prep. Whatever sander you have, if it has any kind of dust pour and it might have a bag, take the bag off, and sometimes there is a vacuum attachment in there. Even if you don't have a dust collector, just hooking a sander up to even a shop vac goes a long way in improving your sanding performance because what happens if you're not moving the dust out from under your sanding pad here is you collect a pile of dust which builds up heat and then your energy and work goes into just putting heat into that pile of dust instead of moving it away and heat is the enemy of sharp so you dole out and wear your paper a lot faster and you're not cutting as well because you're just re-grinding dust instead of cutting your surface. <laughs> All right, now I can see my wood, got a good feel for it. I see anywhere I need to fill, let's get some filler on it. While the putty dries, I'm gonna go ahead and get started on the legs. Now, I thickness here, three quarters of an inch. Perfect, I know I want the top of my table to be 26 inches for this little side table. So that means 25 and a quarter is the length I need my legs to be. If you're doing like a dining table or anything like that, uh, 30 inches is pretty typical, like 30 to 32, normally 30. Side tables, anywhere from like 18 to 26, just depends, just go measure where, where you want it to be. I'm just using scraps, as I mentioned, so none of these are the right dimensions I need. So just use the circular saw, table saw, to break them down to leg shapes. And again, if you don't have the tools to do that, just buy wood, about the size you need. So for a table like this, some two by two, be great size for legs. Or since you can do a glue up and those clamps are great for it, you can always get two one by twos and glue them together to make a two by two or something. Lots of ways to tackle it. God, I'm an idiot. There's plenty with this because I can do side by side. Durr. I was, I was, jeez. So I took the stock I had, now I have four squares. I only need three legs. <laughs> Another great trick, if you have the material, make duplicates of parts. You can sub in in case you mess up one leg, you've got an extra leg blank. Or, you know, I have way more material here for the aprons, which is gonna go between the legs and under the top than I need. So that way, if I mess up a piece, I have extra ready to go. Two tricks I kind of used at the table saw here was to make my squares, instead of relying on any measurements, you know, so I stood it up on edge and set my fence to the thickness of the board. So then when I laid it over and cut it, I have a square. Also, you notice I used the table saw to resaw this, make it thinner. And I could have cut all the way through, but I left a little paper here. It helps make sure the board doesn't like bind on the blade or flop around, create a hazard. But with that thin little paper, it just snaps right off, but it holds it together. Quick pass with the sander and that little ridge will go away. Putty dried, everything is sanded now to 150. So pretty much finished ready. Now we just need to bring it all together. Now, if you didn't have saws and you wanted to take the super easy route, this is basically where you'd start. You go to the store, buy wood, the right dimensions, and now you're ready to start. Uh, bringing things down to final size. I did rip these down. I want to say they were originally three and a half. Then I went to two and a half. That still didn't quite look right. Did a little math and ended up cutting them down to two and a quarter because these are about one and three eighths. With one and three quarters to two and a quarter, that is very, very close to the golden ratio, 1.62. So if you're ever like, I don't know what size things are going to look right or if things don't look right, use a golden ratio. So all I did was took 
uh, this is a square, so, so it is one and three eighths inch wide. So I took one and three eighths, multiplied that by 1.62. It gave me just under two and a quarter. I just rounded up to two and a quarter for ease. And now when I hold these beside each other, I'm like, that looks balanced, that looks right. So that's, I use a golden ratio to solve any dimensional problems a lot of time when it comes to aesthetics. So keep that one in your pocket. As I mentioned, we're doing a triangular table and obviously this isn't a triangle. So the next step is going to be marking out our triangles. And I, I think I wanna try to work a lower shelf into this. So we'll mark out the triangles for the top and the bottom shelf. Um, how am I gonna join the bottom shelf? Here's my secret, I don't know yet. Don't worry about having everything solved when you build. Sometimes just get in there and if you have 90% of it figured out, you'll figure out the last 10 when you get to it. So I'm just deciding what part of this I want to be my top and front. And I kind of like this little defect here. So we're gonna leave that, it's figure, not a defect. Um, now, in my experience, true triangular uh, tables are just really too harsh with all those sharp corners. So we're gonna ease that up a bit by giving us, let's say a little inch on the ends that will come in. Okay, so now I have a one inch mark and I actually don't know what this dimension needs to be for the front edge. What I do know is my two back legs are 13 inches, but just using my big old framing square here, I can just put 13 and we'll put this there. Oh, it's actually really close to where I need to be. So yeah, just put both the 13s on here. Perfect. Now for my bottom shelf, I'm not gonna add that little bump out because I have a feeling it needs to be a little smaller anyways to fit inside the legs. So I'm just gonna do 13 and 13 right off the front edge. Now I've got two triangles ready to go. I know I've already said it, take the principles, not the design here. You can take these principles and make any table with any number of legs, any size, etc. I'll give you a hint though, if this is your first table, a three-legged table always sits flat. Four-legged tables can rock, so then there's some tricks on making sure every, uh, that they sit flat and use adjustable feet or play some tricks on the table saw or just sand them. The problem is not all floors are flat. So even if all your legs are the same, if the floor isn't flat, you don't run into issues. So adjustable feet is good, but three-legged tables always sit flat. Since these aren't rough cuts, these are my finished cuts two dimension, and I'm not gonna be making any more cuts. I wanna be really good. This is where a friend that can hold things is really handy. But if you're working alone, just break out whatever clamps and find a way to hold your piece. Well, look at that, we got two triangles. So figure out my locations on all the legs. <laughs> to figure out the locations of all the legs, I just flip the piece upside down because this is where the legs are going to go. I want to make sure the reveal is all the same. I started with a three quarter inch reveal, which is pretty common, but I normally do larger things and it just didn't look right and everything was way too close. Oh, it needed to be smaller. Duh, golden ratio. The thickness of my table is three quarters of an inch. So I did three quarters of an inch instead of multiplied by 162, I did divided by 162. That was just under half an inch. So bump my combination squared a little under half an inch, set everything to just under half inch reveal. And this looks really good and now I can move these out of the way. One of the tricks in woodworking is to measure as little as possible. So having laid everything out this way, I can actually take my board and make my marks directly in place and never worry about what any of these numbers are because I bet they're really weird fractions. But if I just mark exactly in place, it's gonna be right. Another thing that really helps how your projects come together is remembering the relationship between the line and your cut. Because these lines, because my pencil lead has thickness, are marked on the outside and I transferred that exactly. When I cut this, I actually want to make sure that pencil line is still there. I don't want to cut it away. The way I help myself remember that is I put an X on the outside of that line and now I know that line needs to stay. If I put an X on the line, that means I need to cut exactly on the line and the line goes away. If I want to be on the other side, I put an X on the other side. Because if I cut that pencil line away, this would actually be a little shorter than when I need it to and it'd pull in my legs a little bit. This is a construction tool and I know if I use that to make these fine final cuts, I'm not going to be happy with how clean it comes together. Sawing straight by hand is not hard. The biggest thing is you want to just make sure your body's out of the way here. It's easier to move straight. 
And the trick to being square is actually to use the reflection in the blade. If the reflection of this corner lines up perfectly with the corner on the other side, I'm straight. As I move away from straight, I can see that in the reflection. The other thing that helps not be intimidated by sawing is realizing you really only need to be super concerned about the first inch. As we get deeper, you notice I have a wide blade. So once enough of this blade is in the cut, it's gonna keep itself going straight because it can't really twist much, it'll bind up. All you gotta do is really worry about that first inch or so and the rest will take care of itself. Now, as far as bringing this all together, we're gonna use the infamous Craig pocket hole jig. The only thing I'm gonna make sure I do is do the pocket holes on the inside of the aprons so that way they're not visible from the outside and we're gonna do pocket holes everywhere the aprons meet the legs and then a few to attach the top. Haven't attached it yet, but I got the lower shelf cut out and notched in here. Uh, I just kind of wung it and here's the way I did it. It's possible my legs are not perfectly 90 through the top. So I measured where the legs need to be. And then I set my shelf down, put the legs on top of it so I could mark the depth for the legs and how the notch needed to fit, as well as where the back leg needed to be cut. And then because I wanted these to be fairly precise, cut those out with the circular saw and then just slipped it in here. I literally just stood here wiggling up and down until it looked pretty good. I like this, I think it's six inches from the bottom to the top. And I cut three little spacer blocks from scrap to hold it so it's the same on all sides. Now as far as attaching it goes, I could do some pocket holes on the bottom side. This just really doesn't need that kind of strength and it's gonna be a pain in the butt because I've got a dull bit for that jig because a friend has my good jig right now. So I'm just gonna use some brad nails to uh, pop in here and that'll be just fine. I always forget this stupid thing has a power button. It's like my only, only cordless tool with a power button. So you don't just put the battery in and go, like you've got to turn it on after you have the battery. It's really weird. I broke all the edges with some sandpaper. And one very important step on tables is whenever your legs are, make sure you put a little chamfer or round over on the bottom. I'm using a plane just because it makes me feel like a real woodworker and I have one. You can totally do this with sandpaper though. And the point is when this gets scooted, drug, move around the floor, if you don't have that and a little pebble, dirt, anything catches it, it can easily grab those fibers and you get a big tear. And by break the corner and edges, I really mean something this simple. Just That's done and all we're doing is taking the sharp edge from being machined and just knocking it down a little bit with sandpaper. This is 180, just so it's not sharp. So when you touch it, it's like, oh, that, that's pleasant. I'm not worried about getting a, not paper cut, but a wood cut. And before we finish, we wanna make sure we get all dust off. A damp rag does well, but then you gotta let it dry. I've got air. So that's what I like to use. All right, time to finish. I'm using a not very common product, but I, have a, I had to order it in a gallon for another project and it'll be fine on this one, so I'm just trying to use it. But you could use any kind of polyurethane, walnut oil, boiled linseed oil, spray lacquer, beeswax, butcher block conditioner, whatever you wanna finish this with, especially a small utility table is fine. Now, if you're making like a dining table or something's gonna use, see a lot of use, polyurethane would definitely be a good, a good route. Just like sanding and wood filling, I have an in-depth video on finishing. The real meat of it is basically read the directions on the label. Manufacturers want you to have a good experience and those are best practices. Follow the best practices, you'll probably get the best results. While you get to check out the beautiful oiling shots, I'm gonna talk about possibly the most important step, which is coming up very soon. And that's when we're done and we take this inside and it's visible to the public. Now, this is something that plagues beginners and professionals alike. When someone sees your work that's finished, they're going to be very tempted to correctly and appropriately say, whoa, that's beautiful, that's great. That's amazing. 
you did such a great job. And your intuition will tell you to say, hold on, I've got to point out every single flaw. You falsely complimented me and that is not acceptable. How dare you compliment something that is not perfect? Let me correct you. Actually, that's totally wrong. What you should say, this might be tough, is thank you. They already knew it wasn't perfect, believe it or not. The other thing is they don't care because nothing's perfect and they don't expect perfection. What is amazing and is perfect and is beautiful, regardless of whatever flaws are in your piece, just like the flaws I have and you have and everyone has, is that you took what was raw material, just stuff, scrap, that might typically be seen as basically just uh, firewood or landfill and brought it to life and gave it purpose, right? This, all these pieces w were just junk outside, eventually going to rot and probably get burned if they didn't get a purpose promptly enough. It's now a table that's going to serve a use and purpose in our house and uh, fix a, a slight problem for us. That is beautiful. That is really cool. That doesn't change with any gaps in joinery that are present or if the finish isn't completely even or if there's a spot that I didn't perfectly sand that I missed well enough. It's still amazing. So you say thank you. You just say thank you. That's all you have to say. Because if you've ever complimented somebody and they come back with, oh, you're wrong, <laughs> you know, look at my acne or the hairdresser didn't do a great job or, but look at this crack and look at that gap and how these two things aren't even and blah, blah, blah. If you've ever had someone do that to you, you instantly go from thinking, I'm really impressed by what's happening here to, uh, I, I, I don't know what to say. This just got really awkward. You know what, I lied. It's total crap. You should never try this again. Like, what are you looking for? It's not about you. Think about someone paying you a compliment. They just wanna hear, thank you. And everything they're saying is true because it is beautiful that you took junk and then brought it to life and gave it a purpose. You made something exist that didn't exist before. And similarly, right, if you have someone in your life who just doesn't know how to take a compliment, instead of trying to force them to, there is a better way, especially if they make stuff, to pay a compliment that they can't crack down. And that's just to simply give it differently. So instead of when you see something saying, oh, you look great today, or that's a great piece, that's beautiful, that's amazing, whatever, where they're gonna be like, oh, let me show you all the flaws, right? Especially if they made something, the way you can pay a compliment that they can't shut down is to say, I'm so blown away, you took what I would see as junk and gave it purpose. That's so cool. In a second, I'll show you what this looks like all finished in its home and, you know, as a table should live, not upside down, getting brushed to death. Uh, in the meantime, if you're the kind of person who likes to like, comment, subscribe, maybe even share videos, whoa, thank you so much. That goes a really long way in enabling me to continue making these videos instead of just building furniture for people who pay me. Thank you so much for that. And if that's not your jam, thanks for joining the ride anyway. I hope you learned something, were inspired, or at least entertained. And either way, until next time, make time to make something. <sighs> okay. Audio is still good.